Hello, I am Dr. Laura Bullock, Curator of Beer Noir Civic Engagement Histories Currencies, and I'm here today speaking with one of the artists featured in the exhibition, M.R. Barnadas of Collective Magpie. Before we begin, I'd like to recognize the Kumeyaay Nation on whose territory we currently reside on and benefit from. We acknowledge the Kumeyaay as the past, present, and future caretakers of these lands brutalized by their genocide. I would also like to acknowledge our own presence as current residents of the borderlands of San Diego, Tijuana, a deeply intertwined binational zone of the United States and Mexico with interdependent and uneven economies, as well as social, cultural, and environmental relationships. MR, aka Melinda Barnadas, is an interdisciplinary artist, educator, and researcher dedicated to engaging with the public domain. As an interracial and intercultural duo of U.S. immigrants, she and Korean-American artist Tae Huang established the public participatory practice Collective Magpie in 2008. While they define this practice as a nomadic effort, for most of the past decade, collective magpie projects have been primarily dedicated to the Alta and Baja California borderlands region of San Diego, Tijuana. Their combined privileges of immigration status, positions as artists, and institutional affiliation, etc., have afforded their ability to circumnavigate the U.S. border, work in both cities, and engage their perspectives as immigrants in the production of locally embedded works, often highlighting ignored issues or serving as a collaborative platform for other regional perspectives. Melinda was born in Montreal to parents from Trinidad and Peru and grew up across North America. She holds a BFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in painting, art, and technology, and an MFA in visual arts with a public culture focus from the University of California, San Diego, with a year of regional studies in Mexican art and craft at the Universidad de las Americas Puebla in between. She speaks Spanglish. So welcome, MR. First of all, I want to say that, as always, I am honored to work with you because your work is important and relevant to the present moment and that it deals with an interrogating larger notions that are unique to our time, um, but that have also been present throughout history. So I'm happy we have this chance to talk a little bit more about your work, um, particularly the piece in the Fear No Art exhibition, Who Designs Your Race, a version of which is also featured in La Triennial at El Museo del Barrio in New York City currently. So um, a little bit about sort of, I just want to kind of start with a little bit about um, kind of how I came to curate the show and then um, ask you to be a part of it. So when I took on this curatorial project with the Civic Art Collection and began to really dive into it, I made certain discoveries that maybe one would expect in a collection of this nature, but that I thought were important to address. Some of those had to do with gender and medium. There was a preponderance of white male artists in the collection as a good part of the collection was um, generously donated by wealthy donors who also tended to be white males who mostly favored paintings, for example. Um, in light of this and the problematic, the well-intentioned nature um, of philanthropic relationships, there were other moments in which race seemed to be tokenized. For example, in the case of the writer and artist Melissant and Leslie Lee and the relationship to Jung Ho, um, Melissant Lee actually changing Zheng Ho's name to Cheng Chi in her publication about his life, um, which one can assume she did to make it sound more Chinese in the storybook she wrote, um, which is actually a very sweet story, I will say. Um, but there were many other moments of this nature that I discovered but did not display for various reasons. I was familiar with Collective Magpies Who Designs Your Race piece from its exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego and wanted to include it because of the way it definitely deals with the problematic notion of rac racial identity and categorization amongst other issues, which you will touch on in your presentation. Um, there are many works that touch on the subject of race, but not in such a challenging yet open way that doesn't just speak at the viewer or participant, but ask them to really dive into a space of thought. So with that, I won't say much more and um, let you go ahead and speak about the project. So thank you. Okay. 
Well, thank you for this opportunity to contribute to this exhibition and to speak here today. It's an honor to share a collective Magpie local project in the context of this powerful public exhibition in our city's central library. I understand the Fear No Art, Civic Engagement, Histories, and Currencies show as an invitation to reflect deeply about what civic art collections are and can be, as well as an urgent call for their transformation. This show makes me ask myself, what might a public art collection that is dynamically reflective of our actual local population be like? What would it take to get there? For me, this call to revision and evolution in this show is not limited to our San Diego collection, but rather part of this particular moment of consciousness raising. This show, as titled, is a reminder not to be afraid, that we as artists, curators, cultural workers, and residents must speak to what is left out of the collections, archives, or not mentioned at the tables where decisions are made. To use these observations that are difficult and often professionally risky to mention as opportunities to create more inclusive and equitable environments for all. So thank you for the opportunity to speak in this context. Collective Magpie public projects are produced through collaborative engagement as site-specific interventions. Our work in this show was developed from an experimental arts production studio that we called the Transnational Seminar, held between 2017 and 2018. To share multiple parts of this work, I will give a 30-minute presentation with a few project interventions from that series and related background before we dive into the challenging prepared questions and answers. The work that came out of the Transnational Seminar was created by local residents converging as a nomadic art studio by crossing the US-Mexico border on Fridays. We would meet together in different parts of Tijuana and San Diego, trading off which half of us was in the unfamiliar city as two groups over 27 weeks. In this picture that many know well, San Diego is on the left and Tijuana is on the right. To echo exactly what Laura had said in the introduction, as residents of the borderlands, we know our cities are deeply woven together and affect each other, from the environmental implications to our inter interdependent economies and daily social and political impact and everything in between. The first public intervention series I want to share was developed in the fall of 2017. At the time, the city of San Diego had prepared to protect public safety by allocating a million dollars of its budget in anticipation of intense protests of the border wall prototypes that you can see in the slide. But there were no protests here at the scale anticipated. Why not? When so many here were deeply disturbed by the prototypes. It's important to consider that much of the local population that was incensed by the prototypes and that would be inclined to protest can't make themselves visible as protesters, often due to the vulnerability of being part of mixed immigration status families. Also, the site where the prototypes were installed was incredibly difficult to publicly access and didn't allow reasonable space for holding a protest in view of them at all. So in this place where protest as a civic conversation is very risky to our local population, we as artists, we're able to harness the protections of our own institutional positions, as well as utilize the space of art making to engage in explicitly in the effort of critical but, but non-confrontational protests about border policy in the tourist districts of both major border cities. And we did this through the construction of a borderland street theater. In this image, it's a, a montage of, from our street play U.S. border wall prototype beauty pageant with our performers in their paper mache border wall prototype costumes against the actual prototypes installed in Ote Mesa in this slide. 
It was through the use of their bodies that we could move the prototypes into a place of visible discussion. As was the representation of our own range of experiences and observations with US Customs and Border Patrol that we experienced and our public exploration of different relationships with privilege on both sides of the border. But I would like to explain how this street theater came to be from us, people who have no formal experience in theatrical performance. We were inspired to capitalize on one of our ongoing experiences with this region, noticing the occurrence of institutional naming of a commitment to serve our binational region of San Diego and Tijuana one that could, in our observation, function even more transnationally. And so, when we were invited by the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, through a James Irvine Foundation grant, to consider engagement with millennials at a single local college in San Diego, we saw this as an opening to reinforce the museum's mission to serve the region binationally and establish a new precedent through the Transnational Seminar, which was achieved without a permanent faculty position at any university, but as resident artists with the museum, along with a great deal of institutional maneuvering. We were able to work with UABC in Tijuana, UC San Diego, and Southwestern College to create the structure of this nomadic and credited art studio that brought together students from the Research One, Research Two, and Community College to meet together in different places across San Diego and Tijuana for the five-hour sessions on Fridays with 27 weeks for collaborative production in two groups. It is with this space that we were able to activate the Borderland Street Theater. Our very different lived experiences, exchanges, and shared observations became the content for all of the work that was produced. We also utilized methodologies of Brazilian theater director and legislature, Augusto Boal, for our participants to construct their plays as actors and non-actors from what they were upset about and what their communities were upset about. It was those sentiments that were taken to the tourist centers of both cities to be engaged with by the people there. Also, ever present in this work was inspiration from the former mayor of Bogota, Colombia, Antanas Mokosis, use of street theater and performance strategies to aid the transformation of the incredible, incredible challenges his city faced. From violence, to serious water conservation concerns, to the most famous being the unbelievable reformation of traffic fatalities, from the heavy-handed use of mimes performing in the streets to remind its citizens of traffic etiquette. In our case, what we were actively seeking was to render visible through our bodies a larger community dialogue around issues we saw as living somewhat in the shadows of exchanges at the levels of our neighbors and visitors in our communities. The second project and intervention development I would like to share is what led directly to the work in this exhibition. In early 2017, a few of our seminar sessions were held at the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego while the Dimensions of Black exhibition was up. Dimensions of Black was a large survey show of works by Black artists from the museum's permanent collection. It was the first exhibition the museum named as having been curated expressly along racial lines. At the time, a museum educator gave our seminar a tour of the show, after which our participating students were presented with the survey inquiring about their experience of the exhibit. While strongly impacted by the show in ways we continued to unpack over several weeks, our binational group of students leaving this show named for its blackness had a very challenged immediate response to the first question on the museum survey, which was, 
what is your race? Check the box. The San Diego-based students were very familiar with institutional demographic questions, but the Mexican students were not, and they were upset by a process that forced a fixed definition that they felt didn't match their lived reality. And half our group, with half our group upset, everyone became upset. Although the race and ethnicity categories presented on the museum survey were taken from the 2010 US Census, there was no way to check the demographic boxes in a way that fit everyone in our group equally. As an example, one participant has a black German-born father, Morena Mexican mother, and grew up in Tijuana. This was a powerful moment to witness and participate in. That for half our group being presented with the demographic question on the museum survey was the very first time they were being asked to define their race. It was also curious to learn that in Mexico, a nation of many races and ethnicities, race and ethnicity questions are not asked on institution, institutional or government paperwork at all. Adding to this complexity was that as a group, we experienced the weekly transformation of our collective race and ethnicity as part of our ongoing experiences together. We observed this in the way that many of us were understood as white or not white, and how that whiteness was red changed on Fridays, depending on which side of the US-Mexico border we were on. Our response to this complex experience was to work in the show. The creation of our own demographic survey as an artwork with room to trace some of what was left out of the other form. This poetic exploration of race survey reinterprets a mashup of questions from the 2010 US and Mexican census forms. In this context, the US census is used for a number of reasons, primarily because it is how the US declares its official race categories. As such, it is one of the ways that our understandings and attitudes towards race are shaped in the United States. But who was declared what race in what year has changed throughout its existence? White was always named and the unconscionable, less than fully human category of black people can also be observed, as well as the category of Mexican shifting back and forth as white or not white several times. And in this history of the census, one can observe contingencies and relationalities of racial identities that are each time declared as fixed are again and again disproven within its own archive. In our poetic exploration of race census form, we use the word feeling as a further negotiator and specifier between the self and the race or ethnicity category in the section of our survey that is blue. I feel, for instance, white has the options of not at all, just a little, somewhat, moderately, quite a lot, or all the time with the right in space to describe when and where you feel this way. And it's paired with a follow-up question. Other people describe me, for instance, white, with it the mentioned frequency scale and the follow-up question of when and where. Feelings are where we could locate and begin to discuss the challenges we had with our group's own shifting of racial identities, crossing the border, encountering the museum survey, and also against conversations we had about the dimensions of Black exhibition, and our own considerations around how Blackness felt and read there. What is it to not feel Brown, but read Brown? When and how do we understand our felt racial identities and that of others? Is it significant if they do not align with those of the general discourse? When, how, in what ways? The Mexican government does not conduct ethnic censuses, 
but its national census consists primarily of class-based questions, many of which deal with infrastructure like plumbing and flooring questions that don't translate readily to the US context due to regulations. Still, we felt it important to engage with similar questions from the Mexican service census that would work transnationally. And we do this on the green section of our survey. Beyond that, there are a couple of other sections that are further areas for processing the implication of mixing both class and race. April 20th, 2017, on the trolley platform outside the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego, we conducted the poetic exploration of race survey within the performative environment of our inflatable translucent dome. The participants were able to view the survey and pamphlet explaining the art project and ask questions prior to committing to take it. Our lab coat wearing students attended the survey takers as they completed surveys in silence in a circle of 17 people at a time. It was a continuous flow of entering and leaving the dome, but we were almost always at full capacity until the event was over. So who were these people taking the survey? The light rail line that passes through this location connects downtown San Diego directly to the San Ysidro port of entry. So the participants of the survey were an incredible cross-section of people who work downtown in a big range of different capacities. Also, there were commuting students and folks who were visiting the museum or on their way to dine at one of the nearby restaurants, as well as at least one member of our very large homeless community. 100 surveys were collected that day, and all of them were later available to be viewed. I would like to read a few examples of some of these different responses. One person's range. I feel Hispanic, just a little. Growing up in a border town implies the presence of two cultures. Others describe me as Hispanic, somewhat, when I was young and being biracial was rare. I feel Latina, just a little, when I spend time with my amazing in-laws. Others describe me as Latina, somewhat when I disappear into the ambiguity of brown skin. I feel Spanish, not at all. I don't identify with the colonizers. I feel Mexican American, just a little, with my first generation life partner bonding over shared experiences. I feel Chicana, not at all. I only have minor knowledge base of Chicana issues and history. This trend in seeing how the ethnic categories were directly tied to relative experience with place, family, history, and cultural ideas named in different ways was something that showed up again and again in participant responses. Another person described themselves with these two indications. I feel white all the time, every day. Other people describe me as white all the time, every day. It seems to be my skin tone. While this type of singular expression is a standard notion of race, it was actually much less common, rare even, in the way that people responded to our survey. Here are another two examples of environmentally determined race feelings. I feel white, somewhat, at work when I speak in technical white collar finance terms. Others describe me as white somewhat when I am with friends who speak differently. I feel black, not at all. Others describe me as black, just a little, when they point out I am not white. And the last example, I feel Hispanic somewhat around other Spanish, Mexican, South American people. I feel Latina moderately at stores, parks, businesses. They attempt to speak Spanish to me. I feel Mexican American quite a lot at home with family and friends. I feel Chicana quite a lot at home watching movies, talking with friends. Through an interdisciplinary collaboration with a political data analyst, we were able to employ the tools of public opinion surveys 
and see our participant responses as data that we could locate similar patterns within and express as infographics. Here we use the, U, the actual U.S. race and ethnicity data about San Diego as a point of contrast to our findings. The first inf infographic we made in this slide traced this pattern. The local U.S. census result of 51% white people to 45% people of color versus 14% white people to 86% people of color from our survey. So in our survey, white would be people who indicated they feel white all the time and nothing else, with people of color being those who indicated they felt a single category other than white all of the time, together with those who felt two or more categories, some to all of the time. But the second infographic we made looked like this. The same local census data of 51% white to 45% people of color, and, and naming this time 4% unknown, versus our survey with 14% white people to 3% people of color and 83% mixed. Again, white people, people here are those who indicated they feel white all of the time and nothing else. But in this infographic, people of color has changed to indicate only those who who said they felt a category other than white all of the time and nothing else, with a third ambiguous category of mixed. People who, who indicated they felt two or more categories, some to all of the time. We ultimately used this data comparison. And those percentages were sign painted for public consideration at the same location where the survey was conducted as part of the who designs your race mural on the MCA San Diego with the full hundred surveys on exhibit along with all of the artwork produced via the transnational seminars as the culmination of this borderland series. So a section of this hand painted signage is in this exhibition along with the reprinted banner and a hundred survey responses. I hope this presentation helps give some clarity to where this work is coming from and where our heads were at the time. Thanks for listening. I'm ready for questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for that presentation. So yeah, I guess I'll launch right into the first question, um, which um, regards the poetic exploration of race survey. So you mentioned the discomfort um, brought about by the museum's survey, the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego survey, but you also brought up the dimensions of black exhibition, um, which made me curious to know what were some of the conversations that emerged um, uh, with your students about the exhibition? Um, from the perspective of a curator, I'm wondering which elements of the exhibition they found interesting or problematic. Um, I understand that it was both the experience of viewing the exhibition as well as the survey that inspired the project. Yes, okay. Um, I should mention first that we were an interdisciplinary group. The participants of the transnational seminar were primarily college students from many disciplines, cognitive science, sociology, political science, anthropology, etc. With one lone art major, along with an arts faculty member from UABC Tijuana and an independent arts, arts researcher who were also attending the seminar. So aside from the few with fine arts backgrounds, the tour of the Dimensions of Black exhibition was the first time the majority of the group had been in a contemporary art museum. But to answer your question, I remember that in a way, this exhibition had a somewhat opposite effect on us than the demographic question on the museum survey. The survey question was an unintentional, disturbing, racialized experience for half our transnational group. But the Dimensions of Black exhibition was confusing in a subtler way, in that it felt almost entirely indistinct as a racially named exhibition. Although the exhibition consisted of works from the museum's permanent collection that were created by Black artists from the 1960s to the present, 
the show did not emphasize local reflections of what it has meant to be a black artist or a black person in San Diego. There were very powerful pieces displayed in the show by prominent black American artists. I recall a Carrie, Way Carrie Mae Weems and Martin Purrier pieces and an incredible David Hammond's piece was used to frame the show. But our group was left puzzled about the absence of prominence given to Black San Diego and its artists and specific cultural conversations that had national impact during the time period the exhibition addresses. More specifically, a strong sense of Blackness in the borderlands or centrality given to works that touch on San Diego's own relationship to the civil rights movement, relationship to the Black Panther Party, et cetera, through the present day challenges of structural inequality intersecting with Blackness. Also, our expectation was not that the Black artwork presented would be of one type of perspective or even a collection of artworks intended to be directed at a civil rights conversation. But within this expanded survey exhibition approach, that more of our own complex local history through its artists would have been explored. I see. Okay, so there seems to have been an appreciation for the breadth of historical moments, but it just left something to be desired in terms of geographical and contemporary relevance to the San Diego borderlands. That's actually another sort of reason I was interested in working with the Civic Art Collection, um, just to provide a space to contemplate um, those various historical moments. Um, I know there were works in the collection that came out of the WPA Public Works of Art Project, um, as well as some that emerged from the sexual revolution. Um, so just interested in artworks that emerge out of um, these moments sort of independently, and then also just kind of looking at a collection as a whole. Um, but that's why I brought in artists such as you, um, so contemporary artists practicing that weren't a part of the collection to just kind of, you know, serve as, for lack of a better word, like a foil, or just, you know, to kind of, you know, question and sort of bring to light, you know, some of the issues inherent in um, the civic art collection in San Diego specifically, um, and maybe civic art um, collections more broadly. But I do think it's important to note that since the Fear No Art exhibition, the city did have an, um, an initiative, SD Practice, which brought in, you know, a wide range of, um, artworks um, from different artists throughout San Diego, um, working in different media and, you know, so that's important to note. Um, so things are a little bit different since I initially curated the show, but um, yes, your work is, I, I really appreciate um, kind of what it brings um, and how it really addresses kind of the central core of um, some of these really um, important issues. Um, so speaking of historical, um, important historical moments, I wanted to ask you about the use of Uncle Sam as a motif for who designs your race um, between both the Mexican and US flags on the banner. So Uncle Sam makes me think of the pridefully nationalistic posters geared to procure new recruits for World, World War I. Um, but without the face of Uncle Sam, um, we're just left with the, an accusatory hand. So I was just wondering if there was a specific comment you wanted to make about national identity through the project. Okay. Um. So uh, to, to, to respond, one of the spaces that Tay and I share uh, that has guided our work generally is that of being an immigrant in the United States. Although our experiences of that have been entirely different, it's what I describe as the psychic experience of being an immigrant in the US that underpins and guides our projects. This is hard to articulate um, this experience and not something that I think does justice to boil it down to descriptive sentences to weigh as something that one identifies with or not, but rather many types of liminal states with very specific types of specters that are born out of, but not limited to an immigrant experience to embody. So in this case, the disembodied hand of Uncle Sam has become something other than its original purpose in a different national war. What is it to do right by your nation that asks for the declaration of your race? Let's really think about this. 
where it came from, where it is right now, and where we want it to go. And really, how are we gonna get there? Yeah, exactly, definitely. So, um, yeah, so in addition to that, um, your work takes an interesting approach to institutional critique as a movement. Um, you, you don't critique institutions themselves, at least not in like directly as an early 1990s institutional critique, but rather you take problematics at play in various institutions, whether they be um, brick and mortar institutions such as a museum or larger abstract institutions such as the government. Um, so one could say you take current issues that are problematic and critique them. But I, I do think the institution is an important part of your critique. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, our works that engage with institutional critique, I think, come from mostly from being a participant of a given institution and then directly experiencing what is seen or doesn't fit as a result. Um, it can be something as basic as wondering why there are no other people like us invited. And then thinking about what people like us might mean in complicated ways. Then inviting more of us or leaving gestures that at best ask good questions create precedent, and leave doors cracked for others in the future. Of course here, that conversation has many lenses and is not limited to the constellation around race and ethnicity. And I don't see the institutions as other within these moments of critique, but rather if invited to the table to participate, if we can be named as partner, collaborator, employee, contractor, then the context becomes our table and it's time to make visible to others within what is our institution what might otherwise be unnoticed incongruity imbalance misshape becomes the experience of this relationship and then the artwork becomes a place or maybe even a responsibility to engage with that somehow So in, in looking over the survey responses from the 2017 iteration of Who Designs Your Race, the Poetic Exploration of Race survey um, from that project, um, which were on view in Fear No Art, um, I noticed that in a comment section, someone wrote, very much needed. I hope there is an impact. So I wanted to ask you about whether or not you hope your work has a specific impact. Um, do you hope that your project will be used as a catalyst to approach changing the census, or do you hope for a different, more thoughtful form of impact? I love this question because it cuts to the heart of intention and expectation, especially in these murky waters of a public participatory work. Although we created an alternative census, it was not meant as a literal suggestion for modifying the US census. Definitely not. In fact, that would have disastrous real world effects when it comes to how the census is used to distribute resources within our nation. Also, this was not a project of directed specific messaging. We did not make this to teach people how they are supposed to think about race in the United States, that one gets or doesn't get. Instead, this project at best can create an opportunity for complicated self-reflection to consider our local experience of race and ethnicity with oneself and then others in the community in ways perhaps not considered before. The poetic exploration of race is meant as first as, first as an individual experience, hopefully as revealing to oneself as an explorative diary entry or an honest, perhaps confessional conversation with a stranger. And from there, there is an opportunity to read the very different responses of others reflecting the, on their own racial experience, possibly in ways that are different than anticipated, possibly in ways that invite more listening and the most genuine of curiosity. It is an experiment in public intimacy about race today. Are we able to consider something in another person's described experience that helps bridge an otherwise closed conversation. We don't know. But if there is a hope with the work, it's there. 
but that hope is not why we made the project. We wanted to see for ourselves how people might respond. We were very curious to find out what participants would choose to say, notice, or question, including the project itself. But of course, there's also our profound respect for, the poetic, po for poetic expression at large. We know that a poem can save a life. One just can't predict when or how that happens. So on that note, there's a contrast between the blue and white and green sections in your survey because one um, responds to the US census and one responds to the Mexican census. Um, the blue and white section is more poetic because participants get to answer open-ended prompts, but the green questions are multiple choice and therefore just a little less open-ended and that the answers are in a, in a way predetermined. Or maybe that's my bias that I read them in this way. Um, for example, um, if you shop at thrift stores, which is one of the questions in the green section, one might feel that by admitting that they're giving away something about their economic circumstances that might invite judgment, um, which I understand the Mexican census is trying to do in terms of its measuring um, economic circumstance, um, but it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be read that way. Um, what was your intention with this section? Why did you choose providing only multiple choice questions in the green section? This is the first easy question. <laughs> when we evaluated, you know, in the effort to have this transnational survey, um, when we evaluated the questions on the Mexis, Mexican census, we literally selected and modified the multiple choice questions presented. So this section is multiple choice because unlike the race and ethnicity section, we felt the Mexican census could function transnationally as multiple choice by simply altering the language of some of the questions posed. For the questions that didn't translate as readily, like having access to plumbing, et cetera, we explored what the answers to those questions might imply and created an alternative question. But ultimately, um, as, as has been pointed out, those questions were about class. And while racism and classism, of course, exist in both nations, we, we um, one of the things we noticed was that our Mexican participants insisted that classism was more pronounced than racism in Mexico, while our US residents felt the opposite, that racism outweighed classism in the United States. Interesting. Um, so questions about race, its meaning, how it's used, are especially relevant now in the wake of Obama's presidency and Trump's mobilization of hate groups and blatant support of white supremacists. Um, but it's also important to reflect on how Uncle Sam slash the US government and also the Mexican government has used racial categorization to various ends throughout history. Um, the census being used in the U.S. to identify Japanese to intern, for example, or racial profiling after 9-11. Um, the, the utopic notion of a melting pot or even a patchwork quilt um, not only has never been, but is problematic in itself and its implications of assimilation. So this gets at the tenuous notion of race versus the idea of nationality and thereby very different ideas of equality. So I feel like the title, Who Designs Your Race, gets to the heart of this notion. Um, would you speak to that? Okay. Um, so to respond, um, you know, from the, to speak to the U.S. portion, um, defining bodies in this nation by race is in the history of how people are categorized and quantified in the United States from its inception, with the US Census playing a central role in that. The struggle for racial equality necessitates understanding that we are presently and historically unequally affected by racial ethnic categorization with very different lived experiences as a result. Those are the facts. However, people experience and understand this in different ways. 
and possibly asking questions that leave room for more complex answers that can expose more of what is being experienced in the present, more of what is to be seen, considered, questioned, and faced towards the many efforts needed for ongoing collective social consciousness raising and transformation. And I, you know, I wonder um, how some of the same individuals that take the survey today would respond if they take the survey again 10 years from now? Yeah, <laughs> very good question. I mean, on that note, um, anyone who's watching should go to um, the El Museo um, Del Barrio's website and take the Collective Magpie survey um, revamped um, <laughs> for the 2020 um, on, on their website. Um, but that's my last question for you. So thanks so much. Um, but before we end, can you let every, everyone know where they can learn about um, future projects, although I kind of mentioned um, one, um, and where to find out more about your work? OK, um, yes. There is the new online version of the Poetic Exploration of Race survey. You can take it directly at theracesurvey.com. It was commissioned in 2020 for Museo del Barrio in New York City with race and ethnicity categories expanded to reflect the understanding of its primary audience as a culturally specific Latinx contemporary art museum. So I just wanted to, you'll notice very different um, race and ethnicity categories and, and they, they weren't that explanation. Um, so for the, for the Trienal, um, the results collected from the final days of the recent US presidential election from respondents across the US and beyond will be on display for the museum's Trienal in, in New York to, to open March 13th. But um, past projects can be found on the website collectivemagpie.org. So thank you so much. Yes, thank you so much again for having this conversation with me and everyone who's watching. Um, thanks for listening. And yeah, just once again, it, it's such an honor um, to include this project um, in the exhibition. So thanks so much. Thank you.